If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 32. If you don't know what that is, usually open your Bible to about the middle, and you'll see the Psalms, and you can turn to chapter 32. As you do, let me thank you. I would like to thank you all for two different reasons. One is about exactly two years ago, my family and I crash landed here. And uh, I was miserable, and I looked miserable, and I was probably miserable to be around. But you loved us, and you cared for us, and we are so thankful for the year that we spent with you. I also want to thank you for sharing your pastor with us this past week. Uh, Drew was bringing his material to us on friendship, which has been an invaluable gift, and we were able to have a blast with the Hunter family at our church camp. And as Eric said, Drew is now up at Redeeming Grace Church, um, preaching, and I'm down here. We traded places. It's always great to have friends. We all need friends, but we also, as churches, need friends, and we need friends. And so it is great to have you all as our friends, and uh, we just did this as kind of like a a sign of friendship and solidarity with one another. So I think you're getting uh, the bad end of the deal, but (laughs) you can pretend that that's not true. You didn't have to laugh. (laughs) All right, well, let us begin. Psalm 32, I'll read the whole psalm. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we ask that you would send your spirit to impress and write this word on our heart. It is in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Well, Martin Luther famously said that the entire life of a Christian is one of repentance, which sounds awful, right? We, or at least I, often have a very negative view of repentance. I'll give you maybe a picture of how we view repentance. When I was about eight or nine years old, I embarked on a criminal career. I was in a store with my mom, and I saw a irresistible pack of grape hubba bubba bubblegum. And I decided to sneak it into my pocket, stole it, brought it home, hid it in my little den of thieves behind the sofa in our living room, and went back there a little bit later to enjoy what I had done. And as I was chewing, I don't know if you remember this or if you've had this experience lately, but Hubba Bubba Grape Bubblegum has an intense odor. (laughs) And uh, I'm back there chewing, and my mom says, Danny, what's going on back there? And I was discovered. And I had to confess to my parents, I also was taken to the store, and I had to confess to the store manager what I had done. 
That was one of the worst moments in my young life. I was terrified. And that gotcha moment is often how we view repentance. Psalm 32, however, tells us that repentance is paradise. Repentance is, as my wife likes to say, the sweet spot of the Christian life. And conversely, the worst place to be on earth is in unrepentance. So this morning we're going to look at Psalm 32 in three different, three different sections. The first section, one through five. Second section, six through seven. And the last section, eight through 11. And this psalm begins with the lived experience of David, he has experienced unrepentance. He has experienced repentance. And he takes that experience, he filters it through the truth of God, and then he turns it in verses 8 through 11 into instruction for us. And this is just what the Psalms are, right? It, they are lived, messy, hard, sometimes great life experience combined with, filtered through God's truth, and given to us as instruction. So we see both of these, all three of these, I mean, in this text. So the first we will see that repentance is paradise and unrepentance is hell. Then we'll see repentance is protection, unrepentance is dangerous, and finally repentance is celebration and unrepentance is constant conflict. So first of all, repentance is paradise. The psalm begins, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So blessed, blessedness in the Bible is not some ambiguous, vague, sort of just goodness kind of directed at us from God. It is actually a very concrete place to live. The concrete image that we should have in our minds when we see the word blessedness in the Bible is Eden. Living in God's paradise with God, living with the fall undone and us being welcomed back into community. In Psalm chapter 1, we are told, blessed is the man who meditates on God's law night and day. And he is like, he is like one, a tree planted by rivers of water constantly being nourished and refreshed. His leaf does not wither. He is bearing fruit. He prospers in all he does. It's like going back to Eden. And here the psalmist says that that blessedness is for those whose transgression is forgiven. And those whose transgression is forgiven, we are told, are those in whose spirit there is no deceit. It is not a lack of sin. but a lack of deceit in his heart. So we also see what unrepentance is then, because unrepentance then is the presence of deceit in his spirit. You can read on into verse five when he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. So that's what unrepentance was. He, he had sin in his life, but he wasn't acknowledging it. He was lying to himself about it. So you can sort of think of, a timeline, right? And, and here's sin, and maybe sin continues many times, but here's sin, and sometime on that timeline, later on, hopefully, there is a moment of repentance. And all of that space in between is a life of deceit. Just lying to ourselves. We have all sorts of ways in which we lie to ourselves, we justify our sin, for example. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, called this painting sin with virtue's colors. I'm not proud. I'm just very assertive. I am not a worrier. I just care more than other people. We blame shift. I've suffered so much. I do deserve this. Anyone would have done this if they were in my shoes. 
and a million other things to protect our unrepentance. And this, the psalmist describes as hellish. Look at verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. It's not repentance that is hard. It's unrepentance that is hard. And the psalmist describes this as living in the heat of summer. So, so we're all going to experience this soon, maybe. Uh, 100 degree weather, high humidity, and you go outside and everything is hard. Every step is exhausting. Working is hard. Breathing is hard. Sitting in the shade is hard. It's all hard. And that's what it's like to live with unrepentance in your life. Your whole life begins to turn into perpetual self-justification. You're constantly having this internal debate with yourself that you're actually okay, that you're actually right. They're wrong. I'm right. You try harder and harder to offset the bad that you see in your life with more goodness than bad. You want to work harder and harder to get back or to stay in God's good graces. So this, this entire span from sin to repentance, this entire span is miserable. Everything you do is just exhausting. And maybe you're exhausted here this morning. And there's a lot of reasons that you could be exhausted. It may not be unrepentance, you know. You may have just been at a camp with lack of sleep and uh, you're tired. You may be raising small children. You may be dealing with health issues. There's lots of reasons that you could be tired. But maybe a part of your exhaustion is unrepentance. But there is a way out. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I acknowledge my sin. That's it. That's the way out. That's the way back into the blessedness of forgiveness. God's heart is not bent towards making repentance a groveling misery. His heart is bent towards forgiveness. So bent towards forgiveness. In Psalm 22, Psalm 22, it's the psalm that Jesus claims on the cross as he, as the, he is experiencing the ultimate Psalm 22 moment. So the first lines of Psalm 22 are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus cries out on the cross. But in verse, verse 14 of Psalm 22 and 15, it says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. What does that sound like? That sounds like the hell of unrepentance from Psalm 32. God poured out on Jesus Christ and Jesus willingly entered into the hell of our unrepentance so that we would never have to live in it ever again. So that we could acknowledge our sin and be welcomed back into Eden. There's a way out. Repentance is paradise. And unrepentance is hell. Secondly, repentance is protection. And unrepentance is dangerous. So verse 6. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. So this is interesting. Is there a time when God will not be reached? Is there a time? This is what he says. You you may not be found. I offer to you a prayer at a time when you may, be, may not be found. So it's certainly talking about God. There's a time 
when God will not be found and God cannot be reached, what is that? Well, he talks about in the rush of great waters. So in the Bible, certainly in the Psalms, the rush of great waters or many waters, there's lots of ways that it is expressed. It's talking about the evil of this world, the evil inside of you, the hurt and suffering and pain and chaos of this world that is constantly working against you, threatening to undo you, undo your body, undo your mind, undo your heart. And many of us, me included, can testify that that danger is real. What the psalmist is talking about is going at the evil in this world and the evil inside of me all by myself. That's what unrepentance is. It's living in gracelessness. It's living as if I can handle the evil of this world and the evil inside of me all by myself. Now, we live in a culture which has created ways and avenues in which we can do this. Every culture has them. Here's two prominent examples in our culture. Number one, condemnation. So we, we realize that there's this weight of sin in our heart, a guilt. We may not even be able to identify it, but we, it's not enough that we can look at ourselves and be like, yes, I'm valuable. I'm important. I should be honored and respected, right? We have to create. We have to build something. And so the way we build it is that we just condemn other people. We say there are lines that you simply cannot cross. They may be intolerance lines or racism lines or political lines or sexual lines. And if you cross it, there is no redemption. You must be excluded from everything, everywhere, all the time. And anybody who is nice to you must be excluded. Like you are terrible. We also uh, use victimization. Um, I'm miserable, but at least I'm authentic about it, right? Like, and that gives me a power to be heard. People should listen to me because I have been hurt. And often these, time, these things work together. Because I'm a victim, I can condemn and I can build up a new justification and righteousness for myself by condemning other people. But I would like you to see that both of those paths are all misery. Nobody's happy doing that. Nobody gets on Twitter to be happy. And if you do, it's probably not a healthy happiness, right? <laughs> this psalm is telling us is that sin is poison. It's swallowing little pieces of hell every day. And that affects you. It starts to poison everything in your life. You don't like the person that you are becoming. You soon can't not stand to be even alone with yourself. You get to bed at night and you don't want to think about yourself. You hide from the people you love most. You start projecting a person that you are not. And when they like that person, that just makes you project more and hide more. It traps you, enslaves you into a life of secrecy. And when the waves of evil and hurt come. You're all alone, handling it by yourself. And the last person who is there, as the tsunami wave sweeps over you, pulling you under, the last person holding out his hand is God. And he will not let you go without a fight. but you want to take it on by yourself. 
You won't grab the hand. You want to work your way back to God. You want to wait. You will repent. You'll be sorry. But you got to get to a point when you are good enough, show yourself and show God that you've changed enough that then you can repent. And you vanish deeper and deeper, pulling, pulled down under, rejecting God's grace, rejecting God's help, and cursing God for not loving you all the way down. But you don't have to live there. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You have a place to hide. A place where you can hide from the hard, hurtful things of this world. A place of safety and rest. A place where you can be real and honest and authentic. And that place is not of your making. It's God himself. God himself is the place. He is the hiding place. So what we see here is that repentance is not turning from badness to goodness. It's not turning from saving myself from sin to saving myself with goodness. It is turning from myself. To Christ. Turning away from my ability to save myself to His grace. When you are a sinner, Jesus is the safest place to be. Repentance is protection, unrepentance is dangerous. Repentance is paradise. Unrepentance is hell. And thirdly, repentance is celebration. And unrepentance is constant conflict. The psalmist explicitly turns here to instruction. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And here's his instruction. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle. Or it will not stay near you. So this is a great line to use in marital conflict. Be not. Don't. By the way, this, I was joking. <laughs> so unrepentance, what he's saying is unrepentance is like being a mule. In order, for, in order for the mule or the horse just to stay near you, you have to put a bit and a bridle. And then he's constantly pulling away. And you're like, no, just stay over here. To be near God, it requires constant conflict. God has to constantly be in conflict with you. We create all these layers of self-defense, protecting our sin and our, un and our unrepentance. And so God sends someone who loves us, tries to approach us with grace and humility. And it doesn't matter how gracious and humble they are, Getting to our sin is like going through no man's land in World War I. There's barbed wire and trip lines and bombs going off and bullets flying everywhere. We have excuses and justifications and accusations. We turn into a prosecuting attorney. Well, like I'm the only one, right? God himself becomes someone of constant conflict. His love turns into coercion and control. He gives us commands like a father, like guiding his children, his toddlers, away from the dangerous roads. And we take that as coercion. Christ drinks the poison for us. And it doesn't even penetrate into our heart. There's a reason why the Bible calls an unrepentant heart hard and callous. There's no way in. Just layers and layers and layers of defense requiring constant conflict. Does it require constant conflict to talk to you
about the sin in your life? Now, let me just say, as I say that, it says in verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Unrepentant people are miserable people. What I am not saying is that holiness will thrive in a place full of holiness inspectors. It won't. A place full of holiness inspectors will thrive not with repentance, but unrepentance and secrecy and deceit. People who want to make repentance into a big and miserable project don't kill sin. They kill repentance. And they kill joy. You know what you should think of when you think of repentance? Rejoicing. That's how the psalmist puts it. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. There is joy for those upright in heart. Now, by the way, righteous, upright in heart, what does that mean? That does not mean sinless people. We've already covered that, right? This is talking about not people without sin, but people with repentance. Sin plus honesty in their heart with God, repentance. And there's joy for them. Their sin is covered. They're welcome back. Repentance is a place of rejoicing because those layers right, of, of self-defense are now replaced with layers of God's steadfast love. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. So coming into repentance, turning back to God in repentance, is turning back to rejoicing. Maybe you're here this morning And your whole life, maybe, has been lived in the exhaustion of unrepentance. In the danger and the constant conflict. And you don't even know what's on the other side of repentance. And today, right now, right this moment, you may be moments away from experiencing the safety and the comfort and the embrace of God's forgiveness because Christ has died for you and he has taken your hell for you. And all you must do is turn from yourself and turn to him. Maybe you are a Christian this morning and repentance to you is just something that you did once to get saved. Or maybe you do when things get really bad. But as Martin Luther said, repentance is the life of a Christian. Sin, repentance, you don't have to live in this space of unrepentance. You can live right together. What would it be like if while you were clicking on porn, you were repenting? What would it be like if you stopped in the, in the midst of your marital conflict and you just said, look, let's just pray, God, I don't know who's right. I don't know who's wrong. What I know is, is what we're doing right now is not pleasing to you. It's wrong. It's hurtful. It's hurtful to each other. Please forgive us and please help us. What if repentance to us was like sitting down with our best friend, sharing with him every day the things like, I'm, I did this and it's stupid and I hate myself for doing it. And I'm so sorry and I'm afraid that this will never go away, that I'll never be different. 
And that friend sticks his arm around us and he says, I know. You're forgiven. I've taken care of it. And we're going to go through this together. The entire life of a Christian is one of repentance. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we can repent and be forgiven. I pray for each and every one of our hearts this morning that there will be no deceit there, that we will rejoice in your forgiveness even as we confess our sin. And in the name of Christ I pray, amen.